Welcome to this video introduction to Spoken Blackfoot. In this video, we'll cover the sounds of Blackfoot, some basic grammar, and a few key phrases you'll want to know as you begin learning the Blackfoot language. This video is being prepared for students at the University of Calgary, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Blackfoot people and the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Okay, let's get started. Oki, Nitaniku, Apokyayu. Nitasanamatsok, Pitaki, Sipimi. Hello, my name is Joey. I was transferred the Blackfoot name Apokyayu, or White Bear, by Horn Society Elder and my teacher, Pitaki, Sipimi or Spotted Eagle. The Blackfoot recordings you'll hear in this video were provided by Spotted Eagle specifically for new learners of the Blackfoot language. He gives slow, very careful pronunciations of each of the words to help you learn the sounds of Blackfoot. As you get more comfortable with the language, you'll want to speed it up to sound more fluent. To begin, I'd like to start by playing a Blackfoot prayer. By listening to this invocation, you'll gain a little bit of cultural understanding of the people whose language you're about to start learning. Blackfoot prayer. Me chita pia chimwe ikan. Ayo ichipeta piyo pa. Ichikimachin kupinna. Is umu inon and no chistikoik. Kimokinon is the macho kinon. Soka e ikina e mukamu da e. Ayo, kima to kinon. Nichita pi minon nich. Ok, gamutan. Nishami pata pi sini. The Blackfoot language is part of the Algonquin language family in North America. It's spoken by approximately 3,500 people in southern Alberta and northern Montana. The modern Blackfoot writing system was invented by Donald France and contains just 13 letters and one accent for vowels. The vowels of Blackfoot are I, A, and O. The consonants are P, T, K, S, M, N, W, Y, H and an apostrophe that we'll refer to as glottal stop. We'll begin by taking a look at the vowels. The I vowel in Blackfoot is pronounced like the E in the English word C. The A vowel is pronounced like the A in father. And the O vowel has two pronunciations, either as English toe or two. Both are perfectly acceptable, as we'll see in the next slide. Here are some words in Blackfoot. Pay attention to the red colored letters and try to learn the sounds associated with those letters. In this word, you'll notice that there are two double O's. Pay attention to the pronunciation of each set. You'll notice that the first set sounds like an O, as in toe, but the second set sounds like an O, as in two. Like I said, both pronunciations of this vowel are perfectly acceptable. In this next phrase, we'll hear two pronunciations one with an O vowel and one with an U vowel. Nitaniku. Nitaniku. 
Let's listen to that one more time and see if you can pick out the O and the U. Nitaniko. Nitaniko. Those are the basic vowels of Blackfoot. Now, let's look at the consonants. We'll start by looking at the stops. The P in Blackfoot is pronounced like the P in pi, T as in tie, and K as in the Greek letter chi. However, if your native language is English, these may sound a little different to you. They may sound like by, die, and guy, respectively. Let's take a listen. Beat. Now, if your native language was English, that first sound probably sounded like a B and not a P. A way to trick yourself into pronouncing Blackfoot correctly is you can simply substitute the P's with B's, the T's with D's, and the K's with G's. Let's listen to some more. A beat. Do me. An interesting aside about this word that you just heard, means happy morning. This isn't how you wish someone a good morning. This is an affirmation that it is a good day. Here are the words with K's in them. Next sound we'll look at are the nasals, M and N. These are almost identical to the English M and N sounds, as in may or nay. Here you can hear a couple of words using the M and N sounds in various positions within the word. Next, we'll look at the glides, W and Y. The W is pronounced like the first sound in way, and the Y is pronounced as the first sound in yay or yellow. Be Quick note about this phrase, what is it, inanimate. Blackfoot divides nouns into animate things and inanimate things. This question is asking about what is that inanimate thing. We'll come back to this a little bit later. We'll also come back to the glides Y and W a little bit later because they do some interesting things depending on what part of the word they're found in. Next, we're going to look at S. Typically, S is pronounced the same as in English, like the word say, but S can also combine with other sounds to give a ps as in lips, a ts as in pizza or bat or a K to give X as in stakes. The tricky part, if your native language is English, will be learning how to make these sounds in the middle of words rather, gen, rather than just at the ends. Here's an example of a word with a PS sound. This is the version of the question we saw a few slides ago, but this one refers to what is it, that animate thing. Again, we'll come back to the concept of animate versus inanimate a little later on. Next, we'll look at the KS sound. And the TS sound in the response to that question. So much to you, 
The final consonants we'll look at are H and glottal stop. These may be unfamiliar sounds to you. Glottal stop sounds like the absence of a sound. It's how you might produce the hyphen in uh-oh, or if you had a British pronunciation of words like bottle, mitten, butter. H has two different sounds in Blackfoot, depending on what vowel it follows. If it comes after an E vowel, it's a hissing sound made in the middle of the mouth. If it's after an A or an O vowel, it's a harsher sound made at the back of the mouth, like Here we have H after each of the vowels, so you can have a listen to see how it's produced in words. It will have the same sound after an A vowel. But it will give that middle of the mouth hissing sound like a after an I vowel. These are very common sounds in Blackfoot, as you can see in the next sentence, which contains many of them. Let's go back and look at the glottal stop again. Like I said, glottal stop sounds like a pause where nothing is actually being said. Once again, Spotted Eagle is producing this word very slowly and accentuating that pause. As you get more comfortable with your spoken Blackfoot, you can reduce the length of the pause for glottal stop. Those are the simple sounds of Blackfoot. Now let's go on to some other combinations. Blackfoot has long sounds, both vowels and consonants, and they're written as double letters. They're pronounced just like the single sound, but held a little bit longer. In the first word, you will see a short A written with one vowel, and compare that to the second word where we have two A vowels side by side. Let's listen to those again. Infrequently, you can get three vowels put together in Blackfoot to give a super long sound, as in the word my grandparent. Let's listen to the three of them in sequence. Blackfoot also has long consonants, not just long vowels. You can compare the single K in this question to the double K that follows it. That double K sounds very similar to a glottal stop. Effectively, you're holding the K sound just a little bit longer before you release it. Kitanikoa. You can also have a long S in Blackfoot, so you can compare the single S in the first word to the double S in the second word. And the difference is just holding the S a little bit longer. In linguistics, when two vowels merge into one vowel somewhere in between the first two, this is a process called coalescence, and Blackfoot does this. If you have an A vowel plus an O vowel, the result will be somewhere in the middle, like an A, as in English, paw. Again, these two vowels side by side are produced as one vowel, but the sound is somewhere in between both of the original vowels. If you have an O plus an E, or an I vowel, you'll get an OI, like in English, OI. Ni 
And finally, an A plus an I vowel will give you an E eh sound, like in English, said. Nitesinats. Blackfoot is a pitch accent language. Those little marks above the vowels tell you where the pitch accent falls. Pitch accents are a little bit like stress in English, though in English we tend to make our vowels longer or louder to indicate stress. In Blackfoot, the prominence is given by raising the pitch of your voice on that syllable. When you get to a vowel that has an accent over it, that's your cue to make that syllable the most prominent one in the word. A piece of advice that I got early on when learning Blackfoot was when you get to that pitch accent, give your knee a quick slap. That'll drive up your pitch and make sure that you know that's the most prominent syllable in the word. Compare the vowels colored in red to the other vowels in the word, and you'll hear how that is the most prominent syllable. And that's exactly what you're going to do when you encounter a pitch accent. At the end of a word, some of the sounds in Blackfoot are produced a little bit differently. Earlier on, we were talking about W and Y. There's two sounds frequently found at the end of words in Blackfoot, WA and YI. In this question, you can hear the WA at the end of the word. Frequently, however, this WA is left off, as is the case in the reply to this question. The same is true of that very common yi ending also found at the end of words. Frequently, it will be left silent as well. I'm one step ship, namu. I do have a few tips for you in figuring out how to do this. The first rule of thumb is if it's a question, go ahead and pronounce that wa. If it's not, you can probably make it silent. There are a few other things at the end of the word that you'll want to consider as well. And here's the tips that I give the intro class. At the end of a word, if you encounter a short vowel, that's one written with one letter, don't pronounce it. If the end of the word ends in a long vowel, or one written with two letters, you can pronounce it quickly as though it was a short vowel. Un. Finally, if the word you're looking at ends in a consonant, forcefully release it. A beat. If I can offer one other pronunciation tip for Blackfoot, you may have noticed that some of the words can get very long, especially if you're comparing it to a language like English. Break the word down into syllables. It'll be much easier to pronounce a syllable at a time, and as you get more comfortable with the sounds, you can start stringing them together more fluidly. That's it for the sounds of Blackfoot. Now, we're going to move on to a little bit of grammar. A few minutes ago, we were talking about wa and yi. These are actually grammatical markers that attach to the ends of nouns to tell you something about what the noun is doing in the sentence. Linguistically, Blackfoot is described as approximate obviative language. To go into depth about what these two terms mean would require a completely separate lecture. For now, let's think of them kind of like a subject and an object of the language. If a noun is the subject of the sentence, the thing doing the action, it'll take a wa marker. If a noun is the object of the sentence, the thing having the action done to it, it'll take a yi marker. Earlier on, I also told you that Blackfoot divides things up into animate and inanimate categories. When we talked about how to ask, what is that thing, and referring to something that was inanimate, the question was, tsa anista biwatsks. 
When we change that question to ask what is it and referring to an animate thing, the question became tsa anista psi watsks. One interesting thing about Blackfoot is that only animate nouns can be the subjects of sentences. So animate nouns can take the suffix wa and either animate or inanimate nouns as the objects of sentences can take the suffix yi. The other way that Blackfoot divides up nouns is between singular and plural. If an animate noun is plural, whether it's in proximate or obviative, subject or object for our purposes here, it will take the eeks ending. An inanimate noun that is plural, instead of taking ye, will take the easts ending. One thing to note about using these endings, especially with the wa and the ye, if you tried to add them to a noun that ends in a consonant, we'll delete the W or the Y, leaving just the vowel. We've already seen this quite a bit. One example was the noun apple, apastamina. Because we tried to add a WA marker to the end of the apple, which ends in M, we deleted the W and we were left with just the vowel. If the apple was the object of the sentence, as in, I ate an apple, Nitsoi apastamin. It takes the obviative marker yi. Again, because we try to add the yi to a noun that ends in a consonant, m, the y was deleted, leaving just the vowel. Regardless if the apple was the subject of the sentence or the object of the sentence, whether it took the wa ending or the yi ending, if it's plural, we'll pronounce it with an x ending because it's an animate noun. So to say, I ate apples, you would say, nitsoi apastamina mix. Now, does this make sense that an apple is an animate noun? Maybe to Isaac Newton, who discovered the laws of gravity when an apple fell on his head, but apples can't really move around on their own. What you'll soon discover is that just like the distinction between masculine and feminine nouns in a language like French or masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns in a language like German, the categorization of nouns as animate or inanimate is an arbitrary decision of the grammar and isn't necessarily reflected by whether an object can move on its own in the real world. Here's a list of nouns in Blackfoot and we'll look at how they change between the singular and the plural. Man is an animate noun, and so it takes the suffix wa, which means when we put it in the plural, it'll take the suffix ix. Ninna. Ninek. The same is true for the noun woman. In the singular, it'll take the wa ending, and in the plural, it'll take the ix ending. A geek. And for bird. Beek seek. Now again, man, woman, bird, these are animate nouns, and they make sense because in the real world, these reference can move of their own volition. But a knife is definitely an inanimate object. However, grammatically, in Blackfoot, it is an animate noun, and it takes that wa ending. Because we've added it to a noun that ends in a consonant, the w is dropped. Girl is also an animate noun in Blackfoot. As is horse. Now, would you like to take a guess as to whether or not meat is an animate noun? No, it's not. Meat is inanimate, and so it takes the ye ending. And when we make that plural, it'll take the east's ending. Eat 
The same is true of a book. It is an inanimate noun. Now, if knife was animate, do you think arrow will be? Unfortunately, no. Arrow is an inanimate noun and takes the ye and the east's endings. The same is true for a bed. And a bow. In utter bewilderment of how, for example, a knife can be an animate noun, but an arrow is an inanimate noun, one of the elders I work with told me a joke. He said, why is it that a pillow is an inanimate noun, but a blanket is an animate noun? Well, it's obvious. A pillow just lays there. But if you get a couple of people under a blanket, Okay, now let's talk, instead of nouns, a little bit about verbs. In English, we say, I walk, you walk, but he, she, or it walks. That S at the end of the verb tells us that the subject was third person singular, he, she, or it. This is called subject verb agreement. And Blackfoot does this as well, but it does it with first, second, and third person. To say, I ate an apple, I would say, Nitsoi apastaminam. To say, you ate an apple, I would say, Kitsoi apastaminam. The neat at the beginning of the verb tells me that the subject is first person, and the kit tells me in the second example, that the subject is second person. Neat is I or me, and keet is you. To get a third person, we also agree with the subject, but instead of having something that goes before the verb, we'll add this wa suffix to the end of the verb. This is a slightly different suffix than you saw on the nouns, and it means that the subject of the verb, the person doing the action, is third person singular, he, she, or it. And in this case, instead of nitsoi or kitsoi, we would say oi apastaminam. He, she, or it ate an apple. We can now look at some simple sentences in Blackfoot. We had this example where I wanted to say he, she, or it ate an apple. Oi apastaminam. But what if we want to say who he, she, or it was? Maybe the thing that ate the apple was a dog, specifically that dog. Um, imitao. Just like in English where you say he walks or Jason walks or that dog walks, we're still going to realize the subject verb agreement on the noun, sorry, on the verb by adding that wa suffix. That dog is third person, so our verb is also going to have third person wa. So I could say, um imita oi apastaminam. That dog ate an apple. If we had the second person pronoun, gistu, or you, we would also agree with our verb and use the kit prefix on the verb. Gistu, kitsoi apastaminam. You, you ate an apple. And the same is true for the first person, nistu, or me. Nitsoi apastaminam. Me, I ate an apple. And this will go through all of the grammar. You will have to specify on your verb who your subject was, even if you say your subject separately. Okay, we've been talking for about a half an hour now, and I'm sure you've had more grammar than you ever thought you would in a half an hour span. So I'm going to leave you with a few helpful phrases 
that'll assist you in starting to learn Blackfoot. The first word you'll want to learn in Blackfoot is how to say hello. It's pronounced this way. Okay. A fun thing you can do with the word for hello, okay, is the longer you've known someone, the longer you can stretch out that O oh at the beginning of the word. After you get talking, you'll want to find out how the person you're talking with is doing. How's things? You can ask that this way. Once again, when you get more comfortable with speaking Blackfoot, you can reduce the length of that pause for the glottal stop and produce it a little more fluidly. Hopefully, with whoever you're speaking with, things are going good, and so they'll say that. But maybe you catch them on a really great day, and they might say things are very good, they're great. Perhaps you just went up to a random person on the street and started speaking Blackfoot, and they too speak Blackfoot. You're probably going to want to learn their name. This is the question to ask that. Remember, this is a question, so you can pronounce that wa at the end of it. The answer, on the other hand, don't produce your wa. Nitaniku. Nitaniku. My name is White Bear. No matter what language you're learning, you're going to want to learn how to learn or how to say new words. To ask, for example, what is the Blackfoot word for a chair, you would ask this question. Chair. Or if you encounter a word that you don't understand, you can ask what the meaning of that word is. is a chair. Okay, that's an introduction to spoken Blackfoot. I'll leave you blackfoot.atlas-ling.ca this website has a dictionary fully searchable in English or Blackfoot. It'll provide related words, some sound files, and even a few video files to help you learn the Blackfoot language. It also has a number of other digital resources that are available. You can also check out the Linguistics Division here at UCalgary. Every year we teach the Indigenous Languages 205 course which is an introduction to a local indigenous language to Calgary. Some examples that have been taught in the past are Stony Nakoda, Plains Cree, and of course, Blackfoot. You should feel free to contact the Linguistics Division to find out which language is being taught in a given year. I hope you've enjoyed this brief, albeit intense, introduction to spoken Blackfoot. And I hope you continue learning the language at your own pace. Thank you.